Jessica Williams is American born and has lived on Noongar country in Western Australia for 11 years. She is a member of the WHRC Australia and New Zealand Working Group, founder of the WA Feminist Lobby Network and co-convener of Single Sex Prisons WA. Jessica is a mother, wife, busy writer and published author, a successful campaigner, lobbyist and activist and an ex-incarcerated woman and victim survivor of non-state torture, extreme male physical and sexual violence and obstetric and police violence. She believes in speaking up loudly against injustice even when her voice trembles. Jessica's survival through multiple traumas and hardships over 39 years has helped shape her into the tenacious and staunch radical feminist, activist and woman she is today. And you can read Jess's article, Just Admit You Don't Care If We Die, includes demands for change, ending male violence against women and children uh, on her blog. And you can find the Single Sex Prisons WA Facebook page on Facebook. Can I ask you to introduce yourself a little further and give us some details of your involvement in advocating for women's sex-based rights? Thank you to Janet and Anna for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight uh, about Article 8 of WHRC's Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which of course uh, reaffirms the need for the elimination of violence against women, which is uh, fitting because um, this past Thursday was the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. So, um, yeah, timely uh, presentation. Um, as said, my name is Jessica Williams and I've lived in Western Australia for about 11 years. I run numerous campaigns and groups, uh, including Single Sex Prisons WA, which is currently the only group in Australia focused solely on the corrective services policies which allow men to be housed as and with women in jails and prisons. Um, I also started the WA Feminist Lobby Network, which was counted as a stakeholder for the WA Law Reform Commission's review of the Equal Opportunity Act with a portion of my submission reflected in the discussion paper for the review. Our group efforts to influence the consultation and review were supported by women across Australia and the world with hundreds of women sending in submissions. And I know some of the women in attendance tonight sent in submissions. So thank you very much for your support. Uh, the amazing women in the lobby group consistently write to state and federal politicians, as well as business owners, um, to advocate for the rights of girls, women, and children. I'm a writer and a published author, as Janet said earlier, having used those skills to raise awareness about women's sex-based rights and threats to our rights, in particular regarding different forms of violence against women, including gender identity ideology. I wrote Just a Neat You Don't Care If We Die, which includes the demands for change, I've submitted those demands to numerous state and federal representatives and am seeing a lot of the demands being considered since my lobbying efforts began. My work has been published by Rain and Thunder Feminist, uh, Radical Feminist Journal and shared by Feminist Legal Clinic amongst other feminist groups and websites. And I led a nearly three year long campaign which ended successfully in August this year with safe access zones being introduced, uh, implemented finally in WA law, which means girls and women um, accessing reproductive health clinics for abortion and other services can no longer be harassed or intimidated and neither can the staff at those clinics. What made you first realize transgenderism is a threat to women's rights? It happened in stages for me um, quite gradually for a while to the point where you, you know you, you don't realize until the end of that but then once you're there you can look back and see the trail that led there but the I guess a pivotal moment for me was when I was labeled transphobic purely for um, saying that I would prefer always prefer a female gynecologist to perform pe pelvic exams on me. And I was labeled transphobic for that by a woman who considers herself a feminist. And she then proceeded to uh, 
um, start a very vicious public, you know, campaign against me for a couple of months, if memory serves me correctly. Um, so that was like on the, on that personal level, you know, it, it really jolted me. With my political lobbying and activism, I really noticed. Uh, that it was an issue and realized the severity of that when certain policies were implemented in WA seemingly out of nowhere. And for example, the Corrective Services uh, Department in WA implemented a policy one year ago, which breaches the sex-based rights of incarcerated women and girls uh, by allowing men to be housed as and with women. And they did this at the end of the parliamentary calendar uh, in November last year, and seemingly without clear, uh, like really clear um, and transparent public consultation. So it really just came out of nowhere. We were actually really concerned about what was happening in other states and then boom, got bit in the butt. <laughs> um, so that's really, really when I, I stepped back and thought we've got a serious problem here. And I and that actually initiated a lot of action on my end to, to start uh, working against this issue in, in particular. Um, and I have spoken about this issue extensively. Where's the area that you are focusing and where's that taken you? I do research on um, and lobby about nearly everything, you know, within that scope. Uh, and I spend a lot of a lot of time doing that. And I spend a, a lot of time writing, whether it's for, you know, my blog or uh, letters, templates, just all kinds of stuff. But um, I am very concerned about the lack of work in the area of incarcerated girls and women and their rights. So, um, and as well as being an ex-incarcerated woman myself. So I do spend a lot of time focused on that issue, uh, as well as focusing on the issue of violence against women. And that's a very, very, you know, um, wide, vast issue. Uh, but I do spend a good chunk of that focus on the ways in which gender identity ideology are, are worsening the already deadly issues of male violence and also making it much more difficult to address those issues. Um, so, yeah, I do spend a lot of time in that area trying to just get information out um, in various ways. Um, I would like to quickly expand on, and on this and discuss how women and girls in WA are being routinely let down by WA officials, in particular in relation to Article 8 and gender identity ideology. And I'll start by just sharing a brief snapshot of the state of violence in Western Australia. WA had the highest rates of, quote, family and domestic violence in the country in 2018. One news article states, WA is the epicenter for the nation's uh, domestic violence scourge with almost two in three assaults committed by the victim's partner or relative. The extent of the state's problem is revealed in an Australian Institute of Health and Welfare report, which shows WA has the highest proportion of assaults related to family or domestic violence in the country. Unfortunately for women and girls in WA, our officials have seemingly been captured by religiously aligned ideologies regarding the existence of gender identities. And this is reflected throughout state departments and bodies and the policies thereof, making the state of violence in WA much worse. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we have the corrective services policies already. Um, our minister, for women's interests and child protection is also the Minister for the Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence. And she is seemingly captured by this religious ideology. She's been written to numerous times by multiple women expressing very serious concerns about women's and children's rights in WA, yet she continues to regurgitate the still technically illegal redefinition of woman that WA state labor included in its plan for gender equality. Her response given even in regards to a new refuge for women and babies escaping violence. In relation to article eight, particularly the part about states collect 
collecting accurate data to combat violence against women. WA officials are failing women in this area too. Outright lying on one's birth certificate is already allowed in this state as it is in, in most places by falsifying one sex marker. And to make matters much worse, WA police have been identifying and processing people based on their self-identified gender rather than the sex on their birth certificate since at least 2018. On top of this, shockingly, six years of sexual assault email reports were recently lost by WA police. Um, and I have some articles about that as well if you want some more information on that um, as everything I'm referencing. Furthermore, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare report that I mentioned earlier states that there are already data gaps in key areas for including for victims of violence and perpetrators of violence. So an unknown amount of false data is already circulating in WA and has been for years, while other data has been lost. When there are, are already data gaps in key areas at a time when there is an urgent need for accurate and thorough data to help establish effective strategies, to combat the shocking rates of, of violence in this state and across the country. Can you talk a bit about the opposition that you faced and how this is impacting you? The WA uh, Women's Minister that I was referencing earlier is seemingly dodging me. <laughs> um, I've, I've really tried numerous different ways to get a meeting with her and she's just not having it at the moment. Um, and I feel like, you know, I feel like that is her dodging some accountability on, on women's questions and concerns about the redefinition of woman and the, the, the connected loss of sex segregated spaces and services and rights for women in, and girls in WA. Um, so that's, that's frustrating. Um, there are other politicians and business owners who are hesitant to speak about this or meet um, and they shut down discussions immediately. If we do meet, uh, even if you have, you know, really important information, re you know, really time sensitive information, just urgent information, because I feel like a lot of this is extremely urgent. Um, it, they shut those conversations down and it's, it's very frustrating. Uh, I have lost connections with people, a lot of people that I thought were friends and that I thought uh, would be able to think critically, particularly about something that seems so obvious. But I do constantly have to remind myself that I was there at, at some point and, and was confused and uh, you know, manipulated by, by other people to believe malarkey. So uh, I do have to remind myself of that. But yeah, it's um, when you see people that you respect and that you know just falling to the wayside over this stuff, it, it's it's troubling. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really troubling. Um, I've had men in my private messages demanding that, you know, I say trans women are women um telling me what I can and cannot say even going as far as telling me where I can and cannot go locally so that they do not have to be around a transphobic bigot um and I have had to actually be physically around some of those um, men that sent those messages messages to me at events and look, you know, I felt okay that that I wasn't going to be physically assaulted because it was someone that I'm just gonna be honest, I felt I could take. <laughs> but um, but it it absolutely messed with my mental health and my anxiety um, because I already have high levels of that because of past trauma and everything. So um, I have had to deal with uh, several instances similar to that. Um, and uh, as I referenced, you know, lightly mentioned earlier, I've had women uh, lead very public and private um, hate campaigns against me for being transphobic and a bigot uh, because of my right to what happens to my body um, and and things like that. 
so um yeah i've i've had a lot of stress and high amounts of stress on the public and private levels um for the work i do from all different angles what are the next steps for you and your organizations Um, And do you have suggestions for WHRC attendees? So I'm currently lobbying federal politicians regarding women and girls that are escaping sexual violence and the demands for change. I've been doing that for, I think, around two years now on the demands for change. So still um, pursuing that. And I'm committed to continuing my work, nurturing a devoted feminist lobby network in WA. We've, We've really had you know, some some really nice success so far. I have started, um, this is aligned with what um, Jean and and Linda are doing and have been doing for so long. Um, I've started an international network for the rights of incarcerated girls and women. And part of what we do is just supporting each other and the work that we're doing in our, you know, in our locations, in our areas, because there are so few um, women working on this issue. Um, And we will be joining together to advocate for the rights of incarcerated girls and women on the international level, particularly with the United Nations. So uh, watch that space. And we definitely want um, others to join us that are interested in devoting time to some of the most traumatized and uh, vulnerable women on the planet, incarcerated women. So if you are interested in getting involved with that, reach out to me and I can, if you're not in Australia, I can direct you to the closest country contact or, you know, go from there. Um, I will continue to lobby politicians about everything, um, whether related to uh, gender uh, nonsense or not. Um, And I will continue to share my skills with other women and other activists and um, do what I can to not only raise awareness about our rights and threats to our rights and what can be done about it, but also to influence younger women and, and show them that there is a feminism out there that does not seek to destroy their safety and their privacy and their rights. Um, so that, that's very important to me. Um, and lastly, just to close, I wanna say that although the, the state of violence in Western Australia is truly appalling um, and has been for a while, the number of women taking action to address it is growing. And so is our momentum and our dedication to these issues, as well as our determination. And I think that that is definitely echoed across Australia and across the world. So yeah, just uh, keep fighting for the elimination of all forms of violence against women and children. That is what I will be doing. Thank you.